The opening round of Blancpain GT World Challenge is here at Brands Hatch this weekend and free practice one is getting underway because the cars now make their way out onto the circuit. Uh, it's the full Brands Hatch Grand Prix circuit. We've got an excellent entry for the sprint series effectively. The uh, Blancpain GT World Challenge, the new moniker assigned to the two sprint races that we have, the five events within the World Challenge and then of course there are the five races in the Blancpain GT Series Endurance Cup to make up the World Challenge at Europe and we're looking forward to what's going to be a fascinating weekend of racing uh, and the cars heading out onto the circuit for free practice one, an opportunity for the drivers, some of whom are new to Brands Hatch, to get a feel for the place uh, and also for the teams that don't do the Endurance Cup uh, to cycle through some running. This is the first track time they've had, nothing yesterday, so it's an opportunity for everybody to get a feel for exactly what car and Brands Hatch will be like. We've been to Monza, of course, and we've had the Endurance round, won by Andrea Rizzoli, Zaydash Kanani and Klaus Wackler. Uh, they are not here because they're only doing the Endurance Cup races. Andrea Calderani is here. He's doing both. Dennis Lind, Marco Mappelli are not. Nor is Yama Verma, but Mauro Engel and Lukas Stoltz are here. So, t uh, so too is Timo Bogoslavski and Nico Bastian. Uh, the other uh, drivers you see within the top five out of Monza uh, concentrating only on the Endurance races. So that's going to leave the way clear uh, for a few different names to take glory this weekend. We don't have Bentley, for example. We don't have the Garage 59 Aston Martins. But as I say, we do still have a very strong entry indeed. David Addison and John Watson trackside. An hour of free practice then is underway as the cars have gone pouring out onto the circuit. And we'll start looking at times very shortly. Uh, GT cars around here are always great value. And John, we are in for, as ever, a dramatic weekend. Well, welcome to the Brands Hatch Bulls. Welcome to Brands Hatch. Old school circuit, old school commentator. <laughs> Happy birthday, John, by the way. Cheers, because thank you, John's thank you very much. Today. Thank you, everybody at SRO. And uh, we won't mention the fact that we had to get Red Adair to put out the blaze with all the candles on the cake. But uh, we are in, as I say, for free practice one. Uh, you saw Christopher Meeks a moment ago having a look at what was going on. The first element of the session is for the lower graded drivers, the bronze and the silvers, which gives them and it's a good idea, the track time without the hot rods behind them and they're having to dive out of the way of all the gun drivers all the time. Yeah, I mean, remember, Brands Hatch, 2.4 miles, 3.9 kilometres. I mean, this is one of still the great motor racing challenges. It's a very, very heavily used racetrack for all forms of motorsport, primarily on the Indy circuit, but when you get out onto the Grand Prix circuit, you've got some real, real challenging corners. And again, just watching bottom of Graham Hill Bend, First time here, I suspect, for Tibor uh, in the, uh, the Mercedes is watching as he comes through. Certes out onto then Pilgrim's drop. This is what well, it's actually the, slightly the rise, then the drop down Hawthorne Hill under the bridge and then into the challenge of Hawthorne's bend itself. Mega, mega corner. And then the short sprint from there down into Westfield. And watch for the bumps in the middle of Westfield. Watch the car's vertical movement as he goes up, up, but down over the bumps. And down. Anyway, I think they've actually improved it a little bit from the last time we were here. You may be right. Bogoslavski, who is new to Blanc Pan in the Silver Cup, and he's setting the target time. But of course, as the pro drivers head out later in this hour of free practice, so the times will come down. Out of Sterling's, and now the run underneath the bridge down towards Clark Curve. And it is Sterling's, the corner every year that we come to Brands Hatch for this sprint event that catches out one or more because they run the curb and the exit. Of course, it's, it's cold here at the minute, it's about 9, 10 Celsius. Track temperature probably maybe about 15, maybe up to 18 Celsius. Very cold track conditions, but the curbs are wet. There's been rain past two or three days. So the rain is hanging in those curbs. You've just got to remember to not run the curb until we're well into a session and most of the moisture has been uh, cleared away. At the moment, it's Nico Bastian who is the fastest. He's the reigning Silver Cup champion. You're looking next at Hiroshi Hamaguchi in one of the uh, Orange One FFF Racing Team Lamborghinis, the fleet of them, uh, and 519 is the car that Hamaguchi shares with the British driver Phil Keane. Hamaguchi we've not seen very much of in European GT racing, but he's done Blancpain GT Series Asia most recently, and Asian Le Mans, and GT Asia, and Super GT. So he's uh, done quite a lot of miles, but he's new to Brands Hatch. Yes. What I'm interested in, just looking at the entry list, is that this new team managed by Andrea Caldarelli, who is actually one of the drivers 
in that pro car, but they're covering every single base. They've got a Pro-Am Cup car, they've got a Silver Cup car, and they've got a Pro car. I mean, if they don't get one of those three cherries <laughs> at the end of the weekend, well, I will be speaking to Andrea Caldarelli and saying, there's a P50, P45, P55 is when you get old, P45 <laughs> at my desk, you know, just get your act together. Yeah, like you say, they've covered every base, haven't they? Jim Clark, we're looking at. Now, he was in the walls a little bit at Monza. Uh, and we had an opinion, and the stewards had an opinion, and I don't think they met, did they? We, we did discuss this post-race, but our take on the incident Jim Clark had with Raymond Voss was different from how the stewards saw it. Yes, and I, I felt that maybe, with hindsight, not mine... Uh, <laughs> Naturally. <laughs> that uh, I don't know what... Pla would have been guilty of. He was just taking the natural exit from the first chicane, and he got tagged in the left corner, left rear corner, which rotated him around and spurt up, up, spat him off, literally, yeah. into the barriers on the left-hand side of the track. But, you know, we're sitting in the commentary booth, and others have got different views of the incidents, and there are other camera angles that are not always available to us in the commentary booth or to our audiences at home. So we have to say we agree to differ. Indeed so. Diego Menchaca knows Brands Hatch from years past in single-seaters, but he's yet another driver defecting from the single-seater route to GT. He's in another of these uh, Orange One FFF racing team cars. And Menchaca at the moment is fifth fastest in this session. We're looking forward to seeing the Arm Motorsport Aston Martins. It's a busy weekend for Arm Motorsport because, of course, the DTM programme kicks off this weekend uh, with part of the team. Also, WRT in a similar situation. There's no Vincent Voss, which is pretty rare because uh, we understand he's going to be at Hockenheim, so Pierre Giudone is here to mine the ship. But uh, Vincent Voss looking after WRT's entry into the DTM, which, again, is, is this weekend. Yeah, I mean, there's, it's a very busy weekend on a global platform. Yeah. Thank God we haven't got snow, which I gather is where it is in Belgium. Indeed, the yes. For a different sports car championship. They've had heavy rain and they've got snow forecast. So here at Brown's Hatch in the sunshine, uh, we're doing better than anybody, I think. Menchaka up towards the end of a lap. Nico Bastian's time to beat is a 123.704. Out of Clark Curve, up towards the timing line, he will now come. Where is this lap going to put him? Menchaka goes and does a 125.663. I mean, Nico Bastian's got a pretty comfortable advantage just over a second of the second place. Uh, our second quickest currently, Milan Doncic comes across the line. I mean, I think a 123.7 at this stage with cool track conditions. You can see slightly different shading on the tarmac where there is still a slight residue of dampness here at Brands Hatch. So we're waiting for ambience to rise. The wind is blowing, so that's going to help dry out. But nonetheless, pretty good effort, I think, for Nico. But I mean, no surprise, Nico Baskin, no. I mean, that he's out with the, what I would call the, the bronze and silver driver, he is a silver driver, but he's really, in my view, probably a, a grade above that, but that is his current grading. Now, Matthew Drudy is drawing attention to himself here, 12th fastest in the Attempto Racing Audi. I think there are more Audis on the grid than anything. It's become this new uh, GT3 Evo, the 2019 car. A very, very popular machine, and Audi throwing a lot of effort back into a GT3 programme. Matthew Drudy then, another single-seater convert, is currently 12th fastest. Yeah, there's a big change. We noticed this at Monza. Big change is fundamentally, it's in an aerodynamic area around the, 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 the nose of the car, the, the frontal aspect, and then that all the way round the back of the car, particularly round the rear bodywork and the rear wing. The mechanics of the car, are, I think, I believe, fundamentally, as they've always been, that trusty uh, V10 engine, that is the identical engine, part of the same family that powers also the Lamborghini Huracans. And behind you've got Ezekiel Perez Compank, who is second fastest now. Compank, who's new to Audi this year, moving from Lamborghini to Audi. Uh, another of the Audi's fourth quickest there is the impressive teenager Charles Vietz. And Vietz, who drives for the WRT squad with Christopher Meese could well turn out to be a winner this weekend. Yeah, I mean, Christopher Meese, when I was making my way up to the booth, was making his way into the paddock with a massive suitcase. He said, where are you going? Where did this come from? 
I forgot my kit this morning when I left the hotel. We had to go back and ah. just simply pack up. Anyway, he got here plenty of time. Christopher Mies, of course, one of the heroes in the WRT Belgium RD team. Uh, a man who, if you wanted a, a consistent and reliable and also very speedy indeed co-driver, is one of those that would be high up on your pick list. Now, this is Rick Brokers in the number 10 Audi. Again, a WRT car. He shares with Oscar Turnho, another single-seater gun. And Rick Brokers made his reputation initially as a teenager in Lamborghini Super Trofeo in Europe in the Middle East Championships, but has raced at Le Mans. He's raced in Asia Le Mans, raced in the WEC, and now stepping up to the main class, if you like, within Blanc Pound, both in endurance and the GT World Challenge. Well, there's 48 minutes or so of the session remaining, but of course the first half of the session is exclusively for the bronze and silver drivers only. And again, we referred to it earlier in the session. It gives them an opportunity without the pressure of a, a full field of cars being on the circuit, but also not having the pressure of the, the pro drivers putting a, an additional pressure. They're, they're getting away from it. This is a challenging circuit. But so many young drivers are now being brought up on circuits that, you know, makes Kinetrix racing look dangerous. <laughs> so this is a circuit where the, there are no margins for error. And here, bottom of Grain Hill Bend, need to be careful not to overrun the track limits. You'll get pinged for doing that. But all these corners, particularly from here forward, Surtees out onto the draw free loop. Big, big challenge. And Shea Davis, the Australian, new to the circuit. Now, if he can race around Bathurst, as he has done in Super 2, uh, then uh, Brad shouldn't be a problem for him. But Shea Davis is another driver. Interestingly, having raced in the Asian series, Block Pan GT Series Asia, coming across to Europe, focusing on European racing and on GT racing. And there are more and more Australians looking at this now for a long, long time. He's backed out of this lap. For a long, long time, if they were going to come over and race in Europe, it would be in single-seaters. Now, it's a GT route that they're looking at. I mean, I can understand why the, 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 in Australia, because it's such a macho country, if you're not in something powered by a, a push rod V8, <laughs> you were sort of a bit of a wuss. GT3 racing in Australia is now so popular. 12 hours of faster, part of the Intercontinental Challenge. I mean, if you want a definitive GT race, I mean, Spa 24 is the boss, but it's being closely followed by uh, Bathurst 12 hours. And we've got winners of that within this entry. As you look at 62, that's this very impressive uh, R Motorsport Aston Martin. Is that, is that Ricky Jr.? In 62, no, that, he's in the sister car. That's Aro Vigno in 62. Okay. Uh, Ricky Collard is fourth quickest in number 76. Aro Vigno, uh, who is uh, returning to racing after a few years away, but he was another driver that came from single-seater racing, but was the Italian GT champion two years back. There's something about the R Motorsport the colour, that grey, that sort of battleship grey with the, the blue in this particular car, it just looks stealthy. It works, doesn't it? I mean, it? it really looks... It looks purposeful. Yeah. Also, the car, in, you know, it, it's, it's actual... The, the visuals of the car, it just looks clean. There's no additional, you know, commercial support. The R Motorsport team is a team owned by the Aston Martin Lagonde distributor in Switzerland. So they are able to run the car with pretty much whatever support they want. That's on the side of the car. I think it just looks fantastic. And it goes well. Also, Vigno is, I think I'm right in saying, new to Brands Hatch. Don't remember him having been here before. And Ricky Collard has gone second fastest in the sister car, number 76. So uh, Ricky up to second. Vigno breaks the beam and is only ninth quickest. Improves to fourth quickest on that lap. Get a, you get a feeling that uh, the Aston Martin might be a bit useful around here. I mean, we know that they, the earlier incarnation when it was powered by the V12, the first Aston Martin V12 motor, was one of those really nicely balanced race cars with a V12 engine that had a big wide torque band, didn't do anything that was going to sort of frighten the driver too much. Now with that twin turbo AMG derived V8 engine, same engine that's in the AMG GT3, uh, really capable of producing, I think, a stunning package. Jeff gets a little bit wide, well, just come yeah. up. Seven fastest he is, and uh, we've had the first 15 minutes of the session. Uh, Charles Vitt is another driver new to Brands Hatch, so essential that he gets the miles in here, exploring what the circuit's all about. 
So Viet's shares with Christopher Meese. Well, Meese doesn't need any introduction no. to Brands Hatch, does he? No, he's, he's won here in the past. Yeah. And again, I mean, Christopher Meese, Charles Mertz, or Viet's, not Mertz, Viet's, is going to be a package that come qualifying uh, because one of the difficulties of Brands, having said all the great things about the racetrack, is as is the case of so many circuits today, where you've got such a closely you know, matched field of cars, where do you find a way past a competitive car? And that's something that everybody has to try and figure out. And it is not easy. It usually comes from a driver that you're pursuing being forced into an unforced error, and that might give you the opportunity. But under normal circumstances where you get pro drivers doing their job, it will be difficult. Not to say impossible, but difficult. So Vietz over the timing line, no improvement on that lap. Pit lane getting a bit busier for the moment. Another battle here, you've got the 52 Ferrari, which is the car that we normally see within the uh, Endurance Series only. But this year, Andrea Bertolini and Louis Machiels are into the sprint, and it is Bertolini behind the wheel, and he dives up on the inside line there. Looking to see, we've got Stein Schwartz, set, short horse, out in the attempt to Audi, currently purple, he was purple, in fact he's got the biggest overall, 123.4, just eclipsing Nico Bastian's time by 0, 0, 0,003 of a second, three thousandths of a second, so a good run, short horse in the, in the attempt to racing Audi. Uh, ignore the fact it says Bertolini, just thinking about this, because he would not be in a silver bronze session. That transponder must be in the wrong place. So Louis Machiels, it will be in 52. That was the Ferrari damaged at Monza and other co-driver Nick Hobbison was all feisty and wanted a scrap and all of that because he got drilled at the chicane. But they he did. It. I mean, that was, a, I mean, one of those accidents to say there was clearly, I mean, one thing is for sure, Louis Machiels didn't reverse. He no. didn't reverse back up the track and drive into the Mercedes. That's that. I think we can agree across the board on that one. <laughs> it almost ran out of road going towards Sheen Curl out of Dingle Dell. But uh, Louis Machiel's then heading up towards the timing line. Andrea Bertolini will drive, but not yet. The transponder, uh, the, the, the driver ID positioning is in the wrong place. So uh, it's Machiel's, not Bertolini. <laughs> the third of these three cars is the 26 Audi. Stephen Pallet and Marcus Dinkelhock. I'm just looking to see whereabouts. They are eight. Eight. Okay. So it's still as Palette behind the wheel. Obviously, Marcus will be getting his opportunity in what to talk about eight or so. You know, whatever. Yeah, eight in this time. It's interesting, isn't it, watching the, the, the session like this? Because you've got two sessions within one. You've got the best of the silvers, and then you've got the best of anybody. Uh, so who is going to be top out of the silvers? Well, at the moment, it's uh, Stein's Concourse. Number one is equal Perez Compact. There is fourth quickest in the car that he shares with Dries Van Tour. Way wide coming out of Graham Hill Bend there. Yeah, well, you're very familiar, David, when you're in your other broadcast role of pointing out by going very wide on the exit of Graham Hill Bend. We do it all the time when we come to the, this uh, sprint event at Brands Hatch and the Blanc Power GT Championships. That, uh, that is a penalty if you consider you continue to abuse the exit. It's always an easy part of the racetrack to abuse. You don't want to do it there in the exit of Hawthorne's too much because that curb isn't as forgiving as the exit of Great Mill Bend. But, you know, but, you know. Well, it's carefully policed, and if you do exceed track limits, then the race officials will clamp down on it. There'll be warnings, and then as the weekend goes on, you get to racing, there'll be penalties. That's OK, but he's up the curb. I tell you, not only is he up the curb, his, it was very, very close to catching the grass. I mean, the whole rear, right rear, was right on the curb. There was not a lot left between the end of the curb and catching the grass. That's all you have to do at the edge of the Stirlings, and that car will rotate 90 degrees and go sharp left into the wall on the inside, and will do a lot of damage. So it's some, it's, the, it's the, probably the most unforgiving corner, in spite of corners like Bra uh, Paddock Hill Bend and others, but that's the one that looks almost sort of, well, it's not really a big corner, is it? It is when you get it wrong. Yeah, it's a very big corner when you get it wrong. And we have seen, and John mentioned this earlier, lots of damage there over the years. You're on board now with Ezequiel Perez Compank. In, whoops, 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 into 30s. He, he needs a taxi to get to the apex. Yeah, I mean, he's working the wheel very, very hard. Now, that might be because he's not comfortable with the balance of the car. Certainly, it looked like he was turning the wheel and having to correct, turn, correct, turn, correct. So maybe there's a little bit too much arrow on the front, not enough rear grip. Looks more 
consistent coming through Hawthorne's in into Westfield again, having to ooh, ooh, juggle on the wheel just to correct the back end of the car, wanting to get away from them. Then the dip, then up the hill into gets it through there pretty cleanly. So that's it. Just sort of seems to be some corners he's having to work harder than others. Yeah. Watch Sterling's on the exit, runs the curb, and he likes running that curb. It looks a nervous car, though, doesn't it? You don't it is, but it's not, it's not this is a relaxing board. drive. No, it's not. So out of Clark Curve, he comes. We'll see what the lap time is going to be like, uh, because four fast is here. Actually, he was on a personal best in the first sector on that lap, and as he goes over the line, stays fourth quickest. The lap time was 25.7, so he's 1.3 seconds down on his earlier best, but it does not look an easy car to drive this, and this was the running wide at Graham Hill Bank, and then, of course, going into 30s, he completely missed the apex. Have a look. So watch again, he turns in, turned up, oh, absolutely correct, has to... Look, look at it! I mean, he's sawing backwards and forwards, that's the back of their car, the rear end of the car, is gripping, releasing, gripping, releasing, and every time he puts lock on, and then... So, untidy, to say the least, through Sterling's. Yeah. <laughs> Well, he survived. Yep, he really survived that lap, for now, sure. What, what does the team do in terms of setup? Do you make the car a compromise for the two drivers, or do you engineer it for your lower graded driver, your AM, your Silver, because the pro, in theory, can drive anything, and, and you've got to get it so that the amateur driver, the lower graded driver, can, can get the most out of it? How do they set the car up? Well, I think that, I mean, Vespan 4 is the pro driver with um, Perez Compact, yeah. so Vespan 4, what we know, is uber quick in an ID anywhere. But to go back to the, the issue about car balance, you have to share a car. There's no point in setting a car up that will suit a driver, normally the quickest driver, to the detriment of your co-driver, because that means your co-driver is not going to have the confidence to be able to drive the car with confidence and then potentially could end up going off the track. So you have to work to come somewhere, maybe 60-40, if not 50-50, of course, if, the, if, the, if your co-driver is of a nature where he wants a car that is diametrically opposite to what might be the lead driver, in other words, Dries van Thor, then the team's going to think about maybe this driver pairing is the early to mid-90s. And 76 is the sister car we talked about earlier. Ricky Collard at the wheel of it. Uh, Ricky, whose father Rob races in the British Touring Car Championship. In fact, Ricky had a go in that at the back end of last year when his father was uh, suffering the effects of an accident. But Ricky has developed through his links initially with BMW and now with our motorsport into the Aston Martin into a, a pretty accomplished GT racer and going very well here, third quickest. Well, I mean, if he's got himself embedded into our motorsport as one of their drivers, certainly in the sprint championship, I don't know about the endurance championship, good. The uh, young German driver has Frank Stippler with him, so again, this is a very good combination. Well, I mean, you've got Frank Stippler, it's like having, you know, it's like, I don't want to say having a guide dog, but literally, I mean, Frank is the, is the kind of teammate that will help guide Absolutely. you through yeah. your, your initial experiences, because he's, he's got so much experience, whether it's in current GT3 racing, or in the session, it was the time that Nico Bastian did very early, that was the impressive time track conditions have improved through the session and will continue to improve although having said that looking skyward it's looking blacker than thunder it's certainly a whole load of horrible weather i would say coming from belgium which is where it snowed on the 4th of may it's wrt must have ordered this is the belgian team keep it keep it uh, number 11 audi through and that's Finlay Hutchison, the Dundee uh, born driver, he shares with Fred Verbeesh. Finlay Hutchison up towards Druids. Alex, the qualifying session is going to be at five minutes to four, so they get a lot of track time crammed into today, and then, of course, the two races uh, for tomorrow. So 55, the quickest car out of the silver session, if you like, Stein Scott Horse, now replaced behind the wheel by another of the Australians, Nick Foster he has gone from Porsche to Ferrari and now Audi in his quest to make a career for himself in GT racing internationally. And the likes of Luca Stolz, Simon Gachet, Christian Engelhardt, Kelvin van der Linde, Raffaele Marchiello, Marco Mappelli, they're all pouring out onto the circuit, ready to do a time with only now 28 minutes and counting still to go. Well, I mean, I, I, you might call them a crowd favourite, but Raffaele Marchiello in the 88 Mercedes Certainly spectacular here last year. Spectacular pretty much everywhere, yes. every year. Number 17, Tom Gamble, the young British driver, having his first GT race. But uh, Tom, the winner last year of the uh, McLaren Autosport BRDC Young Driver of the Year Award. 
and a career switch. Having been looking at single seaters, the announcement came he was going to come into GT racing. He's only doing the sprint race, he's only doing World Challenge Europe, so he's a bit behind in terms of mileage, having not raced a Monza, but the plan is to do the five sprint events. Well, the, the five sprint events should just be the order of his calendar, his, his diary ought to be full. But of course, this is usual, the perennial problem of, well, how does the funding, where's the funding coming from? Who's going to pay? He might come and do Spa, I guess, where more drivers are required, because you want well, as many cars and as, as good a driver lineup as you can, so that might be on the radar. But uh, Tom Gamble will be worth watching this weekend. Very, very impressive in Formula 3 last year in the UK. But look good, when that exit out of Sterling's, I thought, look, uh, that's about as nice, whether it was quick or not, it's hard to tell us, until we get the, the lap at the time at the end of this lap, but certainly, the way the body language of the car as it exited from Sterling's, I thought, well, that looks like a guy, a young man who knows what he's doing. 125.495. And there's more to come. Oh, yeah. As the weekend goes on. So Gamble's going to be one to watch, for sure. I mean, there's a, a massive difference. I mean, uh, during when he was went through the test to come out the winner, did he drive... Uh, was it a GT3 car was part of the test, or was it an LM? He drove a DTM. Yeah. I think United Auto Sports took a, an LMP2 yes, car. Yeah. Uh, his brother was a winner in Carrera Cup GB at Donington last week. Now, this is Raffaele Marciello, who we would not be surprised to see go to the top of the times. Well, there's only 30 hundredths of a second away through the first sector. He's coming into the second sector just over half a second away. So, Raffaele Marciello, what will be, in effect, his first flying lap, is going to put himself pretty much into the 1 minute 23, little 1 minute 24 second time band so 120 124.4 up the hill and then the daunting you know man this this the drop when you just get to the apex the racetrack falls away and uh, then they climb up into druids one of the favorite overtaking places but equally one of the ground, but more easily defended down the hill into Greenville Bend. More and more people are trying to make a bit of track space for themselves, coming down the inside, compromising their exit, and hopefully trying to compromise the exit of the car they've just overtaken. Now, out through Surtees, up the hill, onto the quickest part of the racetrack. Down Pilgrim's Drop, look at the bridge, you think you're gonna hit it. Bottom, the compression, then the uphill, and it's much steeper than looks on board, then into Hawthorne, you can carry more speed than you might initially think. Then the short sprint up to Westfield. The bumps in Westfield need to be thought about. Curb on the inside always take a big chunk of that. Then down Dingle Dell up into Sheen Curb. You can't see the apex. You've got to launch the car at it. Then let the car float out. Then back to the right for the cut to get into Sterling's. Run the curb, but no more than the curb. Two gears, and before you know it, you've reached Clark Curb or what I used to call clearways. Love this corner. The car floats out to the exit then just its natural trajectory bring its back onto the line to take you once you get up the hill into Paddock Hill Bend. And traffic ahead as number four then, the Mercedes with Lucas Stoltz at the wheel turns through Paddock and so far only 12 quickest that car. 88 in the meantime is now fourth. Raffaele Marciello did a personal best 123.988 bringing the car into the mix, sharing it with Vincent Abril. Very, very good driver line up there. Interesting uh, that they the, the Packer have chosen to put Vincent Abril in the alongside Raffaele Marcello, where Michael Meadows, who's been his teammate for the last two seasons, both at sprint as well as a, a, a three car or three driver lineup in endurance. But it's Vincent Abril that uh, is in the car this weekend. So we'll see how that relationship works out. Vincent, of course, no longer part of Bentley, but has found a very happy home with the Mercedes AMG team of Aka ASP. So still Stein Scott Paul's time is the best by three thousandths of a second from number 89, Nico Bastian did the time. Uh, you've got Marvin Kirchhoff in now third, or in the third place, uh, Aston Martin, he's now replaced Ricky Collard, and Fabian Schiller up to fifth quickest now, number 90 Mercedes. Seeing a lot of green on the timing and scoring, meaning personal best, which, bearing in mind that the professional drivers are now allowed to go on the track. Stefano Telly, welcome back, Absolutely. Stefano Telly. And an Audi, more or less, restarted with GT3 drive. That's true, he's only missed one 
block power race in Europe, be it sprint or endurance, and that was the Monza endurance race, and it didn't feel quite the same without him. Well, the irrepressible Stefano Telli, always, always of a smile on his face, always happiest when he's behind the wheel of a race car. And welcome back, Stefan. Good to see you at Brands Hatch. So he's won in Audis. He's, of course, raced in the Lexus. And Le Mans winner, Spa 24 hours winner, Porsche Super Cup champion, Sepang 12 hours winner. Uh, you name it, Stefan has been there and done it. Yeah, he had a nasty accident at Spa last year in Eau Rouge and uh, that sort of knocked the wind out of him, I think, yeah. for a month or so. It took him a, a little bit longer maybe than he anticipated. The trouble is, David, I mean, you're not there yet, but when you get to the age that <laughs> Stefan is at, when you have a big shunt, it hurts and it takes it longer. Yeah. You can do bounce back like some little 14-year-old carding genius. But he still knows what he's doing, and he knows perhaps that he hasn't got the ultimate pace anymore, but he's still not far off. He, he, he might be a tenth or so down, but over a long race and over a stint, uh, he'll get to keep the car in a good position, look after it, uh, and be a, a very important part of the team. I think I'm right in saying it was here that Stefan had his first win outside of France when he was in a, a BPR GT race. Might have been a class win, but uh, going back to the late 90s. So it's good to have him back at France Hatch. And Rafael Marchiello is now the fastest on a 1 minute 23.310. And Christian Engelhardt, number 63, Lamborghini, also charging along up to fourth, having done an absolute best in the first sector. That's Marvin Kirchhofer, who's taken over now from Ricky Collard. In the Art Motorsport, Aston Martin comes up to break the beam, and that lap time from Kirchhofer is a 24.8. What I'm assuming is the, the, the Pro-Am or the Silver Cup or the bronze drivers, the ones that went out first, and then their second row there, oh, a little bit over still on the edge of there of Druid from Kirchhofer. Uh, they're on the set of tires they would have started on, whereas the, the true pro, pro cars in my, my view, would be on a fresher set of tyres because they've only literally just started the session 10 minutes ago. So there may be a slight imbalance, just more to do with what the condition of tyres and track and temperature and whatever. So that might help explain why Raffaele Marcello has gone to the top of the timing and scoring in a relatively short space of time, albeit no surprise to me. Uh, one car that I am getting a bit concerned about is the number 25 Santa Lock Audi, Simon Gachet has done one installation lap, and that is all, and that was in the silver session, the silver element of the qualified, the uh, free practice period, the first half an hour. So the fact that they haven't done a lap time at all suggests that there is a problem with that car, and they're running out of time, because they've lost now 40 minutes of this session. Yes, so have got 19 minutes and a little bit left. Uh, hopefully, hopefully that car will get out, but the Aston Martin coming down slowly, maybe just preparing to go through Clark Kerbal, I, I, I find it hard, it's still clear race to me. Anyway, the Aston goes through the corner, gets a good run. So if you're preparing for a lap, you don't need to charge into the corner or break late. You get the car all, you do all your homework. As we watch Marco Mapelli in the Lamborghini, and this team, this Orange One FFF racing team, really impressive debut. I mean, almost to the point where well, grass or racing we thought was a factory entry, but it's not actually a factory entry. This is more of a factory back entry, I think, than, than the grass or, grass or racing effort is. Somebody's run wide at Paddock, you can see the dust settling. Uh, there's also been a report of a spin uh, at turn four, which I think was uh, clear, uh, sorry, Surtees going onto the Grand Prix loop, and that was Stefan Ortelli. Well, I saw, I, out of the corner of my eye, I saw a car on screen, I think, just running very wide and I didn't think that much because the camera didn't suddenly just dive yeah. into what it was. So maybe that's what you know, I, the old peripheral picked up uh, when you're watching the main image on the screen, just the top right of the screen, we saw something a little bit um, unexplained. Now it has been explained. Um, on we go. So Stefan Ortelli doesn't often make mistakes, but he's had a little excursion. Well, Ste that's the corner, David. Remember, we, we were commenting about you see your Paris compact. Indeed. In the Audi, having, he was really having to fight the wheel. And I just wonder, maybe it was Stefano Telli finding a similar kind of balance in the car where turn in, and then all of a sudden you get a sudden snap over steer, and that's just enough to have it, you go offline, and then when you're offline, you get onto the dirty part of the racetrack, and that could cause then other issues to arise. Could be, could be. So Marcello is the fastest, and he's now in the pits. 
Constanza Abril takes over the car. Yeah. So that really, they only have half an hour in this session. Well, yeah, I mean, as well, in the case, it, it, Raffaele Marcello's had about, what, 12 minutes yeah. or so? By the time you come in, do the driver change, go back out again. So who's been misbehaving on the edge of the paddock? And... Wow! Don't want to be doing that too frequently. That was Tom Gamble, wasn't it, in the green WRT Audi? Got away with it, more or less. Right, so pit stops are cycling through. I think that the Santa Lock 25 Audi is about to head back into the session as into the pit lane you see come the 63 Brassa Lamborghini of Christian Engelhardt and also there behind it is the AF Corsa run Ferrari of Andrea Bertolini. Over the line goes there, 56. The Attempto car that's now got Kelvin van der Linde at the wheel. Oh, sorry, Milan Dolce, sister car, Milan Dolce in 56. So Dolce, who was here in GT4, winning races last year, up to GT3 this season. And that car has actually just done its best lap so far, 124.093. So times currently, the gaps, it's the second covering the top 13. So it's not really very competitive at the minute, really, is it? They need to try harder, don't they? they well, think. once this session comes to a conclusion, maybe we'll get more than the... Oh, dropping Phil Keane, dropping the nose of the car, just looked like it came back on track slightly aggressively, but Phil Keane knows his way around Brands Hatch. And in this very impressive Orange 1 FFF racing team, Lamborghini, and no doubt will be, be paying that faith as a Pro-Am Cup entry. So Phil is the gold, and Hiroshi Hagiomuchi, is that right? Oh, that's close enough. Close enough, enough yeah. Do, John, yeah. He'll just yeah, <laughs> have top sticks on his each saying that. <laughs> so, uh, Phil Keen, a very, very impressive over many years of British yeah. GT Championship races, and in some of the blonde power rounds of 2018. Just, just skirts with the end of the curve just kicks a bit of dust, uh, not dust, it's actually a bit of earth up as it comes back on track and into the pit lane for Kulkeen. It's a pro-am car, so there's no argument about the pro. Whoops, somebody's been off there by the look of it, it's number 10, so back onto the road gets the Audi. And how did all this happen? Oh, well, that's how it happened. The way, I mean, the pro was the apex, it was almost in, in Su East Sussex, he was that far off, and we were in Kent, of course, at Brands Hatch. The Garden of England, they call it. Oscar Tunho, it that's, was. That's Kent, not Brad's hat. Yes, quite. <laughs> so Tunho very nearly had to pay to get back in there. He was way, way wide. But actually, he did a very good job in keeping the car from getting into the barriers on the left-hand side. I mean, when you get onto grass, and the grass will still be very moist, a point from, apart from whatever sap is in this young, fresh spring grass that's all around, looking magnificent. Look at that, yeah. Brad's hatch. You almost play your, sort of your Wimbledon men's final in that. Uh, fair play to Jonathan Palmer and yeah, his MSB team. They know how to make a venue look good. Yeah, that looks great. Now, the session has only got 14 more minutes to go. 26 cars we have, and 25 have done a time. I've still got this worry about Simon Gachet's Audi. All right, this is the car that's quickest. It's had a driver change, so uh, Vincent Abril is behind the wheel of it. So Vincent, Vincent... 126.8 was his last half. There we go. Well, where you get, is it? You got everything in this. Down to 11 o'clock, guys. <laughs> Biggin Hill, of course, synonymous with Kent, just literally down the road from the Brands Hatch International Circuit. And uh, I've no doubt that that Spitfire has taken off from Biggin Hill and uh, just flying over this. Uh, Almost as famous circuit as Biggin Hill is an airport. There it is. Uh, can anybody tweet and tell us whether it's a series? One, two, three, four, five, six, or seven. <laughs> Look at that. The Rolls Royce Merlin. You're powering a prop. Ironically, I think the props that are used in these aircraft these days are actually manufactured in Germany. Oh, don't say that. Apparently so. Certainly, 
maybe on the racing. A lot of people race vintage aircraft, particularly in North America. Yeah. Props are absolutely key to your performance. It's a very jumbled order, just going back to the, the times for a moment, partly because you have the lower graded drivers, the inexperienced drivers in the cars. Now it might start to shuffle around again as you get the guns in, but it's still the much yellow Avril Mercedes at the very top. But Kim Louis Schramm's car, now with Frank Schnipper at the wheel, a long way back. Louis Machiel's 24th, now Andrea Bertolini takes the car over. There are some out of sequence, really, and you can expect them to move up when you've now got the quicker driver behind the wheel. Well, we've got Marcus Vickler off behind the wheel of 26. Yeah. So that time, 123.5. Marcus Vickler last up was 133.2. So I would expect in the 11 and a half minutes of the remaining, Marcus Vickler personal time as opposed to the car. The car's time, 66. Christian Schmidt comes through. Clement Schmidt, not Christian. Christian's his brother's Clement Schmidt. So he goes through Westfield, bouncing over the bumps in the road and that almost spits the car out wide and you again see just how unstable the Audis look in relation to other cars especially through that section of the circuit I mean the, the car make no mistake is very very quick yeah. it's just you've got to maybe the level of concentration and the, the focus that you need behind the wheel is maybe a little bit greater than that from some of the other brands so did I say brands other marks <laughs> uh, that are currently on track just over 10 minutes remaining. Dancer Abril was last up 124.9. About one point, say one and a half seconds slower. Oh, 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 on the exit. Oh, that was not very nice looking. 66. Clement Schmidt runs very wide. I mean, a lot of people have gone wide around the racetrack. I suppose maybe because the gravel is still on the damper side. You know, there's a bit of dust being kicked up but uh, there had been some rain earlier in the week, so maybe there's an element of compacting with the, the gravel. These are good below to get that gravel fully dried out. Up 62, Aston Martin up the hill. 13th position, Silver Cup, so drops down the hill, let's have a look and see, and Graham Hill Bend again, look, 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 I mean, if drivers persist in running wide as they come out of uh, Graham Hill Bend, particularly in qualifying, they may get that lap taken off them, it might be their best lap, which would be ironic and probably appropriate. So there is the Frank Stippler uh, Audi in the pit lane. Uh, 62 on track was Aro Vigno earlier and still is, so he's done quite a lot of the mileage in that car in this session. Might be that they say to one driver, oh, you have FP1 and the other driver will uh, major on FP2, a way of splitting up the driving time and, and getting the drivers used to Brown's hatch and the car. Andrea Calderelli has taken over 563 and is up to 11th. And the pit lane's got a bit busier now, suggesting that we're about to have a sort of dummy qualifying effort in the last few minutes of the session. You well, said boots, maybe. Yeah, a good time just to go out. I, I'm not sure they're going to put on a... I mean, the, the, the amount of rubber you have is restricted, so if you don't really need to do it, um, avoid it. The next time these cars will be on track will be 12.30 until 1.30, which is FP2, which should... I'm assuming that we're not going to get a change in the weather, although... The cloud base has come in and that's much lower. If anybody thought that it might be wet during that second session, I would say yes, put a fresh set of rubber on now to see what the ultimate dry track time temperature would be. But uh, if you're going to roll the dice and wait until FP2 from 12.30 to 1.30, then that's when I would imagine you'll use your freshest or even, even a new set of rubber to get a, a true gauge of what might happen then at 5 to 4 this afternoon when we go into qualifying 1 and qualifying 2. Aro Vainia then back into the pit lane. Is he going to stay behind the wheel or give the car back to Hugo de Sadelier? They've bounced between the two of them, but Vainia has done more driving. The B&O, Bangor Olsen, back to car. Away goes the Finley Hutchison and Audi in the background, down the pit road. And there is the Andrea Bertolini, Louis Machiel's 
Ferrari, but we have Louis Machiel's driving in the first half of the session. So Bertolini turning now up towards the left-hander of Sterling's and accelerating his way down now towards the uh, right-hander of Clark Curve. Through the right-hander up towards the end of a lap, 52. Then the Ferrari, I still have it in my mind that this is going to be Louis Machiel's behind the wheel. We've had this transponder gremlin earlier on, but the lap times are not coming down from, from what was set earlier on, so it still makes me think that it's Machiel's uh, behind the wheel. I know it's saying Bertolini, but they've had the driver ID uh, in the wrong place, giving the, the erroneous information. If it were Bertolini, I'd expect the car to be going much, much quicker now. So seven minutes or six and a half minutes still to go. the left-hander of Surtees onto the Grand Prix loop goes William Achilles then. We've got others having done personal bests in sectors, but down towards the right of uh, Hawthorne's goes, as I say, what I'm thinking is still going to be Louis Machiel's behind the wheel. It's a pretty impressive view of coming into Westfield. Uh, I mean, it looks so easy. I mean, there's hardly any effort whatsoever going into the steering input into sheet curve again you look at left hand drive as virtually all the cars i think competing here are there's not very yeah. many right hand drive gt3 cars probably in existence so particularly westfield bend you take up what you think is a big big chunk of the curve in fact it's probably a lot less in reality if you're sitting on the right hand side of the car there we are up through clark curve and then back on to start finish straight so Machiel's goes through and again no improvement, which is reinforcing my belief that it's not Bertolini because Andrea would get the times down. Five minutes are on the clock. There in the pit lane sits the WRT Audi that Tom Gamble was running wide at Paddock with a little earlier. And from Graham Hill Band along Cooper Strait. So Vincent Abriel is still at the wheel of the fastest car. But it is Raffaele Marciello's time, a tenth up on anybody else. And at the moment, you've got the first 13 covered by a second, less than a second. Well, that, that actually hasn't changed for about the last 15 minutes. Mm. And, you know, just comparing, or Greece Band 4 looking at him at number one, I did. But comparing uh, Raffaele Marciello's time from the 88 Mercedes to that of Benson Abril. Benson Abril has not managed to get within a second of that, you know, super speedy Italian teammate. Now, part of that is maybe because Vance and April is getting adjusted to driving the Mercedes here at Brands Hatch. Driving it at Monza was his first outing. Coming here is a slightly different... He's got memories of Bentley and of whatever other marks he's been involved with. But principally, tyre wear, tyre usage, tyre life. On board with Dries van Thorn. Now, the last time we were in this car, it was when his Equal Perez Compact was driving it earlier, and he saw what a handful it was. Is it any more responsive and receptive to what Van Thor wants to make it do? Over the timing line, he is still ninth fastest. Doesn't improve on that lap. Into Paddock now. The difference between... I'm just... You hear the car bottoming out as it got into the curving and the exit of Paddock Hill Bend. Dries Van Thor, in fairness to Ezekiel Perez Compact, is a, a better driver. I know that they would both argue that they're equal, but the reality is Dries Van Thor is outstanding. Perez Compact is exceptionally good slight difference between the two. Watch here now, hand movements on the wheel. There's still a little bit of correction, but nothing like the level of correction that we saw from Ezekiel Perez Compact. Mind you, that was earlier in the session, but I think it just illustrates the difference in the driving techniques, the driving styles, and ultimately the talent of the two drivers. You can have two drivers who can generate the same basic lap time, some make it look sublime, some make it look a little bit more of uh, a hard day's work. Yeah, Vantor is getting the most out of this. Look, personal best in the middle sector, out of Sterling's. Looking good. Now, is this going to be an improvement? We've had an improvement from Fred Vervish, a 124.290, although the bulk of the times in the second part of the session have struggled to come down. Here is Vantor up towards the line, then. The best that this car has done already is a 124.056 and a 124.157. 
is still not as quick as it was doing earlier on. Now, is that because the temperature is going up? Is that because they're on older rubber now? What's going on? And there, just sorry to answer another question, that's the trouble Santa Lock Audi that Simon Gachet did an installation lap with, and it almost looks like they've given up on that. Well, whatever the problem is, there's not a lot of urgency around the back no. of the car. I mean, they are working around the back of the car, whether that's transmission, whether it's a, you know, a drive shaft, you can see bits of the... Is that the oil tank in part? It was full of they got taking the gearbox apart, they're taking the gearbox off. Is it a clutch problem? Is it something that. Well, if, they, if those ID engineers would step back and we could get a, a look in with a camera, we might get a clue as to what they are working at. I suspect a little reflection on our screen as well, but obviously it's in the transmission area. There it is, there is the gearbox transmission. And are they looking at. Is that, it is the clutch, yes. Yeah. It's, it's, it's the, yeah, they're working on the clutch. Unusual to have a clutch. Yeah. I'm assuming it's a clutch problem, because uh, okay. the clutch is certainly removed from the flywheel, and they're putting it back together again. But those Audi Sport faces were suggesting confusion and uh, wondering what to do and why the problem was there, rather than this is what you do to fix it, and they've lost an hour of free practice, so it's, it's serious, that. That's what Abril in the fastest car then, and the time done by Rafael Marchiello. It has been, surprisingly, given that we're at Brown's Hatch and normally we have a lot of drama, a, a rather calm first hour of the, the weekend. So far. So far. So far. So, Vance and Abril's last lap was maybe a lap to accumulate, to sit back and relax, and uh, not really focus on what he was doing now. Can he put together a lap? So, waiting to see through the first sector, 27.06, which I think is fair. It's eight tenths down overall. So what's he going to do now? Nine tenths, so he lost a tenth to do sector one, sector two. And ultimately, this is the last time. He's going to be about a second, approximately, of the time that his teammate, Raffaele Marcello, would bring him down in the middle 124s. So he comes across the line, the middle 124.4. So the time's not coming down markedly. Uh, 63 is pushed back up the pit lane. Why is that happening? Admittedly, there isn't very much time in the session left. Was it released and then they thought there's no point? Or has it got a problem? But the uh, marshals supervising this car being pushed back up the pit lane. Flag is out, session's at an end. So at the end of all of that, it is Raffaele Marchiello who sets the fastest time, but I'm not really sure how much we can read into that because there are so many cars that we feel we've not yet seen the best of. We've seen, I mean, 88 Mercedes, no surprise, got quickest. We've watched Vance and Abril not struggle, but not suddenly get down to the level of times that we saw from uh, Raffaele Marchiello. So that's a curiosity as to why I would have thought that they ought to be within half a second at worst of each other, but certainly it's just about a second, just a fraction over it. And so the cars make their way, having taken the flag, in through the back door of the pits. They don't do a complete lap, they come uh, in through the back of the pits. And Milan Dodger up towards the timing line. So Mercedes, Audi, Mercedes, Audi, Lamborghini, Audi, Aston Martin, Audi, Audi, Audi is the top ten. Milan Dodger then in the Attempto car through. 26 cars we have, and only 25 have done a time. We've got this question mark over the Santa Lock uh, Audi. Number 25, the Simon Gachet, Christopher Hasser car. That Ferrari we've not seen very much of in the session, but to the pit lane comes Florian Schultzer, who shares with Wolfgang Triller. Florian Schultzer moving up from the uh, Lamborghini Super Trofeo, in which he was uh, Am Cup champion last year. So this was, I think, one of the only dramas we really had. People running wide coming out of Sterling's, mowing the lawn. That was uh, Thomas Neubauer. And again, he didn't fight the car, he did his best to edge it back towards the road, but, you know, you've seen drivers flick the car to try and get it back on the tarmac quicker and then lose it completely. Yeah, it was a bit like a snake wriggling in your hand. It was just, it was, it, it wanted to stay on the grass. It wanted to get more and more onto the, it wanted to have an accident. <laughs> but Neubauer did a very good job again, just watching the number of, you, you're, you really are flirting. Mm. I just wonder, has the, the exit curb at Sterling, has that actually been slightly, you know, modified? 
possibly so. We can research that. Uh, it is then at the end of the session, Mercedes to the fore. Raphael Marchiello did the time. Stein Scott Hall second quickest ahead of Nico Bastien and then Stephen Pallet. Uh, Christian Engelhart fifth ahead of Milan Donja. Ricky Collard, Christopher Mies, Ezekiel Paris Compank, and Clement Schmidt rounding out the top 10. And scroll through that and you can see that there's an awful lot of Audi within the leading positions. Uh, but Lamborghini, only one in the top 10, yet to show their hand perhaps. Uh, 26 cars, but only 25 with the time. This big question mark over the Santalock number 25 Audi that Simon Gachet took out for one insulation lap, and we think the clutch problem brought him back into the pit lane. So free practice one at a conclusion. Uh, it is now half past 10, just gone local time, and at half past 12 local time, the cars will be out again for FP2. Qualifying comes up at five minutes to four, uh, and the two races, of course, are tomorrow here at Brands Hatch. So the cars now being uh, pushed back into the garages. Teams will do whatever work is needed, have a look at the data. For the drivers that are new to Brands Hatch, they'll have a think about it and work out where they might be able to find a bit more time going into the next session. But uh, at the end of FP1, it is the Acker ASP Mercedes at the top of the time. So let's have a quick look at some of the highlights of that session. Uh, cars making their way out on track. Number 76, Aston Martin for R Motorsport was a car to look at early on. And so was this real struggle to get around Surtees from Ezequiel Perez Compang. Nico Bastian was looking very good early on and indeed was second fastest for a time. Handed over the car to Thomas Neubauer and it ran wide to the ASP Mercedes coming out of the left at Sterling. But back onto the road, no real harm done. Uh, drivers pitted, driver changes in some instances, tyre changes in others. Stefan Ortelli's Audi on track. Uh, Stefan back in the championship having missed the opening endurance race at Monza. One or two ran wide like Tom Gamble coming out of uh, Paddock and still people ran the kerbs where they could. 5.63, which was the uh, pro class Andrea Caldarelli Lamborghini. In the end, up to 11 fastest. And then we have this big, big lose from Oscar Chunho coming out of Sheen Curve. He got it all over the grass. He got it through the gravel back onto the circuit. But that did the lap time no good at all. So free practice two is going to be interesting now to see what some of the cars and teams and drivers have in the tank. How much quicker can they go now they've learned the lessons from this first practice session, at the end of which Raphael Marchiello is fastest at Browns Hatch for the Blancpain GT World Challenge Europe from David Addison and John Watson. Bye for now.